let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. While he's here, let us adore him. Come on, let's adore him. Come on, let's adore him. He's here, he's in the room. Come on, let's adore him. of the Lord is in this place oh can you feel him in this place this place has been saturated in prayer and the anointing of the Lord is in this place I want you not to take for granted this atmosphere this is the kind of atmosphere that whatever you need you can receive from the Lord Oh, those of you watching right now, and I pray that the fire of God, the presence of God, the spirit of God that's in this place would meet you right where you are, in your homes, in your living room, in your kitchen, wherever you are. I pray that that same anointing that's here will meet you where you are and touch you where you are. I'm glad that he's here. I'm glad he's omnipresent. I'm glad he can be here blessing me and there blessing you all at the same time. It's a privilege to be in the house one more time. Oh, hallelujah. And I'm honored to be here. And I thank God for my spiritual leaders, my mentors, my examples. Amen. I praise God for Bishop Easton Grant and Dr. Joy, Pastor Joy. Mama Joy is what I like to call her. Amen. I'm grateful to God for this privilege, and I don't take it for granted to stand behind this sacred desk. Amen. Because we are living in a time where we need a proceeding word. We need a word not just today, but tomorrow and the next day and the next day. Because God's word is the only thing that's going to stand. Can I get a witness in the house? It's, it's all right to get a little loud and, and, and undignified. Can I get somebody to holler at me to let me know I'm... <laughs> I, I, I know you're wearing your mask, but let, let's just let hell know what, what the deal is this morning. Just, just look at your neighbor with your mask on and say, neighbor, after all I've been through, the, step, the devil still lost because I'm still here. Come on, tell him again. After all the devil tried, it didn't work. 
Cause I'm still here I said I'm still here I may be crying but I'm here I may have a heartache but I'm here Somebody said thank you Lord That I'm here And because I'm here I'm gonna give him the praise All right You're not supposed to do all of that before you preach So let me calm down and I just want somebody to know you're not defeated But you are victorious in Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm celebrating with new life. Amen. The last time I was here, we were shouting that 40% went down to 1%. <laughs> but my Bible tells me that he that has begun a good work in you is able to perform or complete it. How many know he'll complete the matter? I said, how many know he'll complete the matter and he'll heal you completely? And let me just tell you, if he did it before, <laughs> y'all not going to help me today. I can see already. I said, if he did it before, he'll turn right back around and do it again because he's faithful. He's consistent. There's no shadow of turning in him. He'll do it over and over and over again because that's the kind of God he is. Let me hush and get into the word of God. But whenever I get with my family, I just like to celebrate and give God the praise. I honor the Lord for my wife. Amen. Lady Duncan. Amen. And my daughter, amen. I thank God for my brother on the keys, amen. I thank God for him. Brother Quan is a, is a faithful young man, and I, I'm praying God open the windows of heaven and pour him out a blessing that he has no room to even receive. Hallelujah. Let's go to the word of God. We're going to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Thank you, Jesus. I want to begin at verse number one and read just three verses. Thank you, Jesus. Praise your name. When you have it, those that can stand, amen, in reverence to the word of God. Thank you, Jesus. I'm reading from the New King James. Here begins the reading of God's word. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily besets us or ensnares us. And let us run with patience. Y'all excuse me if I jump from New King James and King James. It's King James is in me, but... Looking to Jesus. I can run with patience because I'm not moving in my own strength. I'm looking... To Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the Father. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself lest you become weary 
and discouraged in your souls. I want to talk to you very briefly from a thought, it's a faith race. Just tell somebody, it's a faith race. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this awesome opportunity to stand in your presence and to hear a word from you. We ask you, Lord, speak to us. Speak to the specificity of our needs. Speak until something on the inside comes alive and say we can make it. Speak until every demon and every devil's voice is silenced in our ears. Speak to us, God. Use your manservant. Have your way. Use me as clay in your hands. Use me. Use my mind. Use my mouth. Use my heart. Use everything. I'm yours today. Have your way. And I pray that the truth of your word will penetrate the hearts of your people. We will leave this place transformed by the renewing of our minds. Somebody say amen. amen. On your way down, say it's a faith race. It's a faith race. It's a faith race. Throughout the book of Hebrews, you will notice that the theme is steadfast faith. The writer of Hebrews, whoever he may be, some believe it's Paul, some believe it's Apollos, so some, you know, we argue about the writer, but whoever wrote, we know that they were inspired by God. Because their mission was to get us to have total faith in Jesus. Throughout the book of Hebrews, we hear about those who went through trials and tribulations and tests that should have broken them, but some kind of a way they rose from the ashes with an unfailing faith. And here we pick it up in the book of Hebrews chapter number 12, and he says, seeing that we are compassed about, we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. He's saying you, you, there, there's too many examples of people who went through pure hell in some kind of a way they made it out with their faith intact. It's too many witnesses for you to quit. It's too many witnesses for you to throw in the towel. He says we're compassed. We're compassed. We're surrounded by faith warriors. The warning, he goes in and he warns us uh, about unbelief. He says, don't develop unbelief. You know, that sin that will send you to hell, that sin that will cause you to lose your soul is unbelief. That, that if you, see, we have to understand that Satan's number one objective is to destroy our faith. Oh, let me get a witness. Let me find a witness. Come here, witness. Uh, come here, Peter. Peter, Satan desires to have you. He wants you. Don't you know you're valuable not only to the kingdom, but you're valuable to Satan? That Satan wants you for somebody in here that thinks that you have no value. Even Satan wants you. <laughs> Lord, I feel like preaching in about 10 minutes. I, I, Satan wants to use you to build his kingdom, but I hear Jesus telling Peter, Satan wants to have you. He wants to sift you as wheat. He said, but the problem is I've already been praying. I prayed for you. I've interceded for you. I prayed that your faith fell not. I'm not worrying about you taking a cut or a bruise or even a bang up. But I'm worrying about your faith. Whatever you do, don't lose your faith. Because if you have faith, you can turn around and strengthen the brethren. Can I get a witness? 
The writer of Hebrews goes on to talk about the need for a faith that endures. I've discovered, brothers and sisters, that many times we have a Sunday faith. Oh, yeah, we have a Sunday faith. You know, it's easy to have faith on Sunday. Uh, when you come into the, this kind of atmosphere where the worship and the praise is going up before God, faith can't help but rise. Faith will build up and make you lift your hands even though you had a, a, a terrible week. But something about when you come into the presence of the Lord and when you come into the fellowship of the saints that faith will rise. But, but you don't just need Sunday faith. You need the kind of faith that helps you wake up on Monday morning and deal with life. You need faith. You need, you need the kind of faith that when you get a phone call that that loved one died and, and that you'll never see them again. You need faith. It takes faith to deal with death. Come on somebody. You need faith when the doctor tells you you have this and your faith is saying wait a minute by his stripes I'm here. You need faith. Oh, not, not, not the kind of faith that just makes you shout when the music is playing, but you need faith to help you to stand. You, you need the faith that having done all to stand, stand. That's the kind of faith. You, you don't need shouting faith today. You need standing faith. If I can't do a two-step, if I could just stand. Oh, I want to know, is there anybody in this room that say, I'm standing. I'm not standing on nothing but my faith. I'm standing on the kind of faith that say, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. I need faith that endures. I need faith that can handle the pressure. Chapter 11, we're reminding of many who had this enduring faith. This emphasis continues with our own life of faith described as a race. It's a race. How many know when you're running a race, you're not running for exercise? When you're running a race, you're running to cross the finish line. You're running to win the race. Oh yeah, I didn't run to start the race and just end the race in the middle. I want to finish the race. Can I get a witness? And so our life is described, this life of faith is described as a faith race in which we are surrounded by great cloud of witnesses. The cloud of witnesses refers to those mentions, mentioned in the previous chapter. Uh, the Old Testament saints like Abraham, Moses, so on and so forth. It, it, the Bible describes them as witnesses. And when you look at that word witnesses, many would look at it as a spectator. Witness that, that, that just sits on the sidelines and the bleachers and, and, and just coaches you on. Witnesses, when you look at that word, they, many people believe those who have died and gone on to heaven uh, as witnesses are coaching us from heaven but you know I would argue they are not coaching really us from heaven when you really look at a deep a translation of that word it really means to bear witness it means they were bearing witness now how are they bearing witness they are bearing witness by the life that they've already lived so that so so not only do we have those who are in the hall of faith but God has placed some people in our lives that have went from this life to the next life and the bible says that their life bears witness it testifies to us. How, how does it testify? It testifies that it doesn't matter what you go through if you finish 
See, the devil is, is, is tricky. And I don't like to talk about him too much, so I'm going to get off the subject in a minute. But the devil is tricky. He, he wants you to believe that you can't finish. He wants you, Elder Gabe, he wants you focused on the in-between. Lord, help me. I heard you say something. I heard you say something, Bishop, that made me want to do a backflip, and I'm too big to do one, but I, I, I wanted to do a back. Hey, Bishop, did, did, did y'all hear this when he said it? He said, if he started it, if God started it, see, you have to make sure God started it. And if God started that work, it doesn't matter what happens in between. It doesn't matter the in between. It, it just matters that if you hang on, something is working. God is finishing something. Our problem is we think it's our assignment to finish the work. But he, Lord, 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 he that has begun. See, the first thing you've got to understand is you didn't come to God. He came to you. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. We say it wrong all the time. You know, I came to Jesus just as I was. I was with, come on, we know how we, it's a cute song and I like to sing it too. But the reality of it is he found me. Woo. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, but the master of the sea. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. The scripture says it this way. It says he told his disciples one day, he said, you have not chosen me. Oh, don't get it twisted. You didn't choose God. He said, but I've chosen you. Let me tell you when I chose you. He said, I chose you before there was a when and a where. He said, I chose you before I ever said, let there be. He said, I chose you before the foundation of the world chose you and if I chose you if I started and I don't want to fool with this but if I started it I'm going to complete it so we have witnesses we have witnesses we have witnesses that you can make it we have witnesses that it doesn't matter how long it takes let me, let, me, let me call some witnesses to the stand. Uh, Abraham, the father of faith, who was a nobody until he was a somebody. God walked over to him and said, come here. He said, get thee out of your father's house. He said, go to, he said, follow me to a place that I will show you. He said, I want to wake up your faith today. I want to see if you trust me. This is why he's the father of faith. Because Abraham, he, he, he trusted God to go to a place where he didn't even know where he was going. But he said, I trust your voice. He said, if you follow me there, I've got some promises for you. He said, I'm going to make your name great. He said, your descendants are going to be as the sand of the seashore. Oh, yeah, and we shout on this part, and we dance on this part, and we tear up the church on this part. But we didn't realize that when, he, when we read about it in Hebrews, it said, after he had patiently endured. That was when he received the promise. When you go over in Genesis and you read the account, he, he, he got a promise that he would receive a son, but he went through seasons where he felt like he had to help God. He went through seasons where he didn't believe God like he should, but it was after he had patiently endured, he received the promise. Let's not leave Sarah out. She's a witness. Yeah, 
yeah, she was ear hustling in the kitchen and she heard the, the whole conversation about her having a child and she chuckled. Have you ever had God to tell you something that made you laugh? Have you ever had God to make you such a ridiculous promise that it made you chuckle at the thought that God could do something as impossible as what he promised you? Have you ever heard God tell you you're going to be pregnant and you're going to have a baby as an old lady and you're already barren in the first place? Have you ever had God to tell you something that made no sense? I'm here to tell you that God... That we serve doesn't always make sense. It's a faith race. Oh God, I wish I had a witness. It's a faith race. See the problem today, we want to make sense out of everything. We got to have one plus one equals two. But sometimes one plus one can chase 10,000. Y'all didn't hear what I'm saying. Oh, y'all don't hear what I'm saying. See, God does stuff that doesn't make sense. See, if it was just me and you, we would be outnumbered. But the Bible says when I get with you, then a third person comes in the mix and his name is Jesus and when he comes in the mix we come we go from being the minority to being the majority because when you're walking with God it doesn't make sense it's a faith race tell somebody it's a faith race you got to stop walking in sense and start walking in faith oh I know I'm talking crazy but somebody ought to walk in some faith It's a faith. It's a faith race. And so the word refers to them as those who would bear witness. By their lives, they bore witness to the value of faith. By their exemplary lives, they encouraged us in running this race of faith. Can you say amen? So as we look at the text, we know this, that if we're going to run this faith race, there's some things we've got to lay aside. Tell somebody, you got to lay some stuff aside. Note the comparisons to running. The runner who is running seeks to win. Tell somebody you're going to win. No, I need you to prophesy and tell somebody you are going to win. Oh, yeah. Tell them, tell them again because, see, 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 I need your faith to rise. I don't know what you're dealing with. I don't know what you're up against, but I want to tell you you're going to win. Remember, you, you're going to win because you got some stuff you got. Let, let, me, let me put it better than that. You got a God that secures your victory. Can I get a witness? And so when they seek to win, what they do is they lose as much weight as possible that doesn't affect their performance. They, they, they lose as much of the fact that they can lose. See, we need to lose the fat and keep the muscle. Don't nobody get mad. I'm talking in the spirit. If I, if I wasn't, I failed already, praise the Lord. Tell, tell somebody, lose the fat. Keep the muscle. What is it that I'm laying aside? I, I've got to... I, I've not only got to lose the weight that comes with my physical body, or in this case, my spiritual man, but I've got to, what the runners do is they put on clothes that fit. You can't wear clothes that will hinder your movement. Can I get a witness? So, so they wear stuff that allows them to move in freedom. Mm -hmm. I've got to put on something I can move in. Because if I don't have the right outfit on, 
I'll mess it up. What, what do I need to put on? Come on, Paul. Tell us what to put on. Put on the whole armor of God. The only way I can run this faith race is I've got to have the armor of God. I, I've got to have something on my mind. I've got to have something over my heart. Come on, somebody. I don't want to get into it because I'll get stuck in it. But, but tell somebody, put the right clothes on. Got to get rid of the excess weight. I've got to get rid of the, the, the chafing clothing. I've got to get rid of everything that is in between me and my victory. Can I get a witness? We, we, we two brothers and sisters, like the writer says, we've got to lay aside some things. And a lot of times when we read this, we, we, we read it too fast, all right? We read it, lay aside every way, and the sin that so easily besets us. But I've learned, brothers and sisters, that we've got to slow down when we read that. That he says, lay aside every weight, pause, and the sin. A lot of times we deal with the sin, but we don't deal with the weight. I'm going to help somebody in here. Tell somebody you've got to get rid of the weight. You, you've got to get rid of some weights. Some, some of us have weights of depression. It's particularly in this season that the whole world has been in, we've been dealing with that demon of depression. Yeah, you, 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 that's why the Bible says it's not good for man to be alone because he wasn't just talking about uh, relations. He, he was talking about fellowship. That it's not good for us to be out of fellowship for too long. That we've got to be in fellowship. And so we've been isolated and many of us have had to deal with the battles in our head. Many of us have had to deal with so many things and we've had to deal with them along. And it says it's caused us to be depressed and depression is a weight. It's a weight. Anger is a weight. I don't know who I'm preaching to this morning but somebody that's listening has been angry with God because of a loved one that you've lost and it's a weight it's a weight as long as you hold on to that anger the Bible says be angry but don't sin sin not don't don't hold on to the anger so, so you got to let go of the anger and you've got to learn how to accept what God has allowed We've got to get rid of the weight. Some of us have weights because we have a bad attitude. I'm not just talking about towards other people, but we have a bad attitude towards ourselves. We have a bad attitude towards life. We're pessimistic. We don't have any optimism about us. We, we're not reaching for anything. The hope of God has not come alive in us, and we're weighted down. If you ever talk to somebody, they're always having a bad day. They always, come on somebody. I mean, you know, every time I talk to you, is something wrong. So wait. So wait. And, and the Bible says that we have to lay it aside. It means you have to make a decision to do something with it. Uh-huh. Tell somebody, I'm getting ready to do something with this depression. I'm getting ready. I don't know what your stuff is, but whatever your stuff is, tell somebody, I'm getting ready to do something with it. I, I'm getting ready to lay it aside. I'm, I'm getting ready to put that over there because I'm not going over there. I'm going ahead. Tell, tell somebody, I got to lay this thing aside. Whatever the weight is, the weight could be unbelief. God has made you a promise. He told you I'm going to restore you. He told you I'm going to restore your family. He told you I'm going to heal your body. But you keep listening to the statistics and you keep listening to the doctor's report. You, that's a weight. 
Oh, I need you to hear me. I need you to hear me. I need you to hear me. The worst thing that you can do when you're in a faith race is listen to a whole lot of negativity. When you are in a faith race, you got to put out the pessimists. You got to put out the negative people. You got to put everything out that's not in line with your faith because it's a faith race. I'm not mad. I'm just not talking to you right now because I'm in a faith race. I don't need nobody talking me out of my miracle. It's a faith race. I don't have an attitude, but I had to unfollow you for a while because I'm trying to keep my faith intact. Don't you let nothing get in the way of you winning this faith race. You got to get rid of the weight. It may not be sin, but it's still a weight. It may not send you to hell, but it may take longer for you to get to your heaven. <laughs> Y'all going to help me in a minute? It, it, it may take longer for you to, well, let me put it this way. It may take longer for you to get to where God is trying to take you. Because you're weighted down. I don't, I don't like to fool with R&B in the pulpit, but Erica Badu said, bag lady. She said, you're going to miss your bus. Okay, I'm not going to use her because y'all like, you know he didn't. It, but there's some revelation in that. That if you put down the bags, you can get to where you're trying to go. You got too much baggage. And anybody that's ever traveled knows that when you got too much baggage, it comes with a high price. If you got a few bags, they'll let you go ahead and get on. If you got two, one, in, you know, a personal. But if you got too many bags, you got to pay to carry that weight. There's a price that comes with carrying weight. You're getting old too fast. You're young and you're getting old too fast because you got too much weight on you. You're jealous of other people because they're progressing and they're moving forward in God and they're stepping into their season and you're looking at them hating. No, don't hate. Drop the bags. God doesn't love them any more than he loves you, but you can't catch up because you got too much weight. Doesn't so matter, I'm dropping my bags. Oh yeah, I'm just going to drop. I'll, I'll get something when I get there. I'm getting rid of my bags because I've got to get to where God wants me to go. He said, lay aside the weights. Because Running this faith race will become difficult, even impossible to run when you have weights. Then he says the sin that so, watch this, the sin, watch this, the sin that so easily ensnares us. I, I've been around, I've been in church all of my life, literally. And I've learned that us church people, we like to talk about the sins that don't bother us. I wish y'all would. I just really wish y'all would. I'm going to come over here because Bishop on this side, and he, I know he's going to back me up. We, we want to talk about, well, you know, I don't have a problem with lust. Well, nobody really liked you when you wasn't saved. I'm sorry. Mama Joy, don't get me later for this. You can see she's going to whip me, Lord Jesus, I'm in trouble. I want you to talk about the sin that easily besets you. 
Oh, all of us, all of us, all of us, all of us have a sin that easily besets us. All of us have that thing that the devil knows he can use to try to ensnare you and entrap you. But Paul says, or the writer of Hebrews says, lay that aside. I don't want you to focus on the sins that you don't struggle with. He said, I want you to look at the ones that easily beset you. He said, lay it aside. Put that down. Put it down. That's what God is telling somebody watching me right now. It's time to put it down. Put down that sin. Why are you going with outward friends and you know God delivered you from alcoholism? Come on. And now you're hanging out at the bar. Lay it aside. He delivered you from smoking cigarettes and you're buying another pack. No, no, no. Lay it aside. Come on. That, 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 if, you know, that girl that's at your job that's trying to link up with you and you know you're married, lay it aside. Oh, I didn't come to preach no, no, no peaches and cream today. I came to tell you that it's time for us as the believer to lay it aside. Now, Paul was not preaching to sinners. He was preaching to the church, and he said to the church, lay aside every weight and the sin. Oh, I'm going to get some help in about 10 minutes. So easily ensnares us we need to lay all sin aside but especially the sin that ensnares us the sin that becomes iniquity the sin that becomes bondage and when you really look at it the sin that easily besets us is unbelief You, I, I would argue that the only reason why we do any other sin is because of the sin of unbelief. He said, lay it aside. Because if you believe right, you'll live right. Oh, I'm going to shout on my own message. When you know better, you'll do better. Oh, can I get a witness here? And so I understand that he's saying, lay aside anything that causes you to walk in unbelief. And we've seen the warnings against unbelief. The unbelief will cause your soul to go to hell. Oh yeah, I, I came to tell you because people are dying left and right. And, and I, need to know, I need to tell somebody that before your day comes, you need to be found believing in Jesus Christ. Oh, come on. Can I get a witness? Whenever we no longer believe, we've already lost the race. But if we can stay believing, we may be running a little slow, but we're still running. And I'm encouraged to know that the race isn't given to the swift. Nor is the battle to the strong. But I've got a witness somewhere that he that endureth to the end, the same shall be saved. And so with a full assurance of faith and with every hindrance laid aside, we can run this faith race. And we can run it in the way that God intended for us to run it. He don't want you gasping for air while you run. He wants you to have a pace when you run. He wants you to be focused when you run. He wants you to have freedom when you run. It's too many saved people that's bound. I'm going to stay right there. You say, how can you be saved and be bound? It's a whole lot of saved people that are bound by weights and sin and what people think about them and all that. No, no. He don't want you running bound. He wants you to have freedom. He wants you to have a swag about you when you're running. That this runner, this faith race is not a sad race. It's a happy race. It's a joyous race. I'm so happy to be running in this race. 
And so, not only do we have to lay some things aside, but we need to have endurance. You've got to have endurance. Somebody say endurance. The faith race is a marathon. It's not a sprint. A lot of us have enough energy for a sprint, but not for a marathon. You ever seen the sprint? The sprint runners, they run so fast. I mean, they take off because they know that the trip is short. Come on. But when you're running for the marathon, you're running and you got your pace. Tell somebody, I got my pace. T tell them like I would tell them, mind your business. I got my pace. Come on, tell, tell them, you're all over in my lane. Tell them, mind your business. I, I got my own pace. <laughs> and if you were running your race right, you wouldn't be looking at me. But you would be looking at the finish line. Come on, somebody. It takes endurance. And I found out that when you look at man, it'll affect your endurance. Because man changes. Man is fickle. Man will make you a promise one day and break it the same day. Oh, y'all not helping me preach. But you've got to run this race with endurance. It's not a quick burst of energy, but it is a race that is won over time. It takes us a, a, a sustained effort. It takes discipline. A lot of people want to be a disciple, but they don't want to be disciplined. But it's impossible to be a disciple if you're not disciplined. Come on, the root word there is discipline. Hallelujah, you, you've got to have focus. It takes you denying your flesh. It takes you being thirsty, but say, Lord, I'm still running because only you can quench my thirst. I don't have time to pull over to the side of the road. I've got to discipline myself to keep moving. Endurance. And endurance is a necessary quality. Jesus often taught his disciples the need for endurance or the need for patience. He talked about it in the parable of the sower. That if you plant a seed one day, you can't come the same day looking for a harvest. Oh, Lord. If I had time, I'd deal with the people that walked away from God too quick. That, that walked away too fast. That if you could have just stuck around for a little while longer, your harvest was about to bud through the dirt. Y'all not going to help me preach. But because you didn't have patience, you walked away from a good thing. You walked away from your season. You walked away from your moment, your time. But you've got to learn how to have endurance. He told them about endurance when he talked about uh, his, in his discourse on the Mount of Olives. He told them it takes time. He talked about it even when he talked about the builder, the two builders, one built his house on sand. He was trying to get a quickie. Uh-huh. See, some of us want to look blessed, but I want to be blessed. It doesn't matter how long it takes, Lord. I want to be, I want this thing for real. I, I don't want a storm to expose my lack of discipline to wait on God. I'm going to rewind that because y'all missed it. I said I don't want a storm to expose the fact that I lack the discipline to wait on God. See, your house looks pretty. Everybody's house looks the same. But the foundation is what counts. You've got to have endurance. The writer of Hebrews stressed this virtue earlier when he gave the, the example of Abraham in chapter number six. 
I told you about that already, how he patiently waited. And see, sometimes we have to learn endurance. We have to go through a series of tests. And, and one thing after another thing of God showing you his faithfulness. And when you've gone with God for a while, you learn, stop tripping. You ever been through something? And you thought, oh, Lord, this is going to take me out. Oh, I'm not going to make it through this. And then all of a sudden, at 11.59... Here comes God. And the whole thing turns around. And here you come walking through the church, ready to tear the place up. Come on, somebody. Because there he is blessing you again. But I've learned that we can forget the last thing God brought us through. God said, I just brought you out. You think I'm going to switch up on you now? No, it takes time for you to build up endurance. When you build that endurance, your faith becomes unshakable. We see it throughout the scriptures. We see the faithfulness of God. And how he fulfills his promises. And he teaches us faith. Tell somebody, God is teaching me faith. How does God teach me faith? He teaches me faith by his faithfulness. Is The more he does for me, the more I believe. And the more I believe, the more he does for me. And the more he does for me, the more I believe. And the more I believe, the more he does for me. Because that's the kind of relationship we have. That so much so that without faith, it's impossible to please him. He said, if you want to please me, if you want to make me happy, he says, have faith. Why, brothers and sisters? Because it is a faith race. And in a faith race, it doesn't happen right quick. But it takes time. And you've got to learn how to hold to God's unchanging hand. Paul wrote that eternal life would be given to those who by patience, continuance in doing good, seek for glory, he says. G glory and honor and immortality. Therefore, endurance is required for a successful running in this faith race. That you've got to learn how to take something. Oh, you can't quit at every punch and every blow. But you've got to learn how to take something. Uh, when we were coming up, I don't know... Uh, you know how you all came up but when we were coming up as young men they taught us how to be tough you couldn't be a punk coming up I don't want to use that word but that's the first thing that came to my mind you know hey, you couldn't be soft coming up my god when you were coming up they would go to what they would do what they say go to your body y'all know anything about that they would go to our bodies because they would teach us how to take a punch they would teach it teaching us how to get in a fight and last in the fight. How not to run from every punch. How not to run from a battle. Uh, and that's what God is teaching us. There's some of us when we come out of this pandemic, our faith is going to be on a level that is unbelievable. Why? Because we've learned how to take a punch. We've learned how to take a blow. Can, you, can I get a witness in here? That if you're going to win in this race you're going to have to have endurance and not only brothers and sisters are you going to have to have endurance but you've got to watch this focus in on Jesus if I didn't say nothing else I need you to catch this part right here that if you're going to win this faith race you've got to keep your eyes on Jesus oh come tell somebody look unto Jesus 
That's what the text says. He says, looking unto Jesus. Our focus must be upon the Lord in this faith race. We're glancing at others. But I want you to tell somebody, look at Jesus. We're gazing around, but no, we got to look at Jesus. Because if you want to be distressed, look within. If you want to be defeated, look back. If you want to be distracted, look around. But if you want to be delivered, oh, you got to learn how to look up. Tell somebody I'm looking up because that's where my help comes from. I'm looking up because that's who I'm praying to. I'm looking up because when I say thank you, that's who I'm talking to. I'm looking up because when I dance, I'm dancing before him. I'm looking up because whenever I sing a song, it ain't to impress you. It's for him. Tell somebody I'm looking up. I know I'm looking up because the Bible tells me that there's so many things that is going to happen in this world. He said, but don't trip out because it's the beginning of sorrows. You haven't seen the worst days yet. But how many know you can still have a praise party when hell is breaking loose? How in the world, brothers and sisters, can I praise God when all hell is breaking loose around me? Because I'm not looking at the hell going on around me. I'm looking to Jesus. You want to tell somebody somebody look to Jesus you are discouraged because you've been looking at the wrong thing you want to quit because you've been looking at the wrong thing somebody want to give up because you read too many self help books they didn't tell you for real you can't help yourself and that's why you need Jesus if I could help myself Jesus wouldn't have had to go to the cross but when I needed help y'all not going to help me today is there anybody here that ever needed help and you know you couldn't look to your left you couldn't look to your right but you had to look up Gee, the writer of Hebrews said the whole main key to winning this faith race is you got to to look at Jesus now you're not just looking up to Jesus but you're looking at the example of Jesus because he was the one that superseded every other witness I talked about Paul I talked about Abraham I told you about Sarah but there's one more witness I want to call to the stand his name is Jesus Jesus. The Bible declares that he had a race to run to. His race was to the cross. Can I get a witness in this room? You ought to tell somebody get in the race. And can I hear you a little bit more? Because I want to celebrate this morning. I want to have a praise party. Because just when the devil told me that I couldn't win this race, I saw another witness take the stand. He said, I endured the, the, the harshness of sinners. I endure hatred from the same people I'm trying to save. Have you ever had people hate on you that you were trying to help? Have you ever had people to lie on you and you hadn't done nothing to them? Have you ever had people not to like you? and you just walked in the room they don't even know you but they can't stand you Jesus said don't trip out cause I went through it too let me show you how to run this race he said for the joy y'all not helping me preach for the joy that was set before him he endured the cross he was beyond the cross he was above the cross the cross was beneath 
them but he still came down y'all hear what I'm saying the Bible says that he could have called a legion of angels to bail him out at any time but he endured the cross he endured the cross and he despised the shame because he had a joy ahead of him he could see you and me coming about a sin he could see you and me coming about a sickness he could see you and me walking in our purpose he could see you and me stepping in our power he could see you and me and that's why he died that's why he bled that's why he suffered because he was in a race and I came to tell you that you're in a race you're in a battle but you're gonna win can I get three people in here to get out in the aisle and start giving God the glory because you know that when this thing is over you're going to win I came to tell somebody you can't quit now because you're going to win you can't throw in the towel because you're going to win pick that towel back up and keep on running pick up your victory and keep on believing pick up your joy and keep on moving because no weapon formed against you is able to prosper you're gonna win cause you got what it takes to win this race you got what it takes to win this race somebody need to know what you got you got Jesus the lily of the valley you got Jesus the bright and morning star you got Jesus the rose of Sarah you got Jesus help when you don't have none you got Jesus water when you're thirsty you got Jesus who's a rock and a weary land you got Jesus who's a stone that the builders rejected you got Jesus I must not be in the right place I thought if I talked about Jesus somebody would get happy I thought if I said Jesus somebody would jump up and down I thought that if I said that name something would come alive on the inside of you I'm running for my life I'm running for my life if anybody asks you what's the matter with me tell them I'm saved tell them I'm sanctified tell them I'm holy
Consider him. That means put something on your mind other than your problem. He said, consider him. Tim, when you get to a point where you feel like you can't take it no more, he said, consider him. In other words, he, he said, think about that, that road Jesus traveled to the cross. See, we thought Jesus was the only one that was going to have to bear a cross. But no, Jesus already told us, he said, if you're going to if you're going to follow me. You're going to have to take up yours. This race comes with a cross. I know that, that, that we only preached about the blessings. But let me tell you, it comes with a cross. But I don't have to worry about it. Because Paul told us, he said, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, Corona ain't even worthy to compare. Whatever you're going through is not worthy to be compared to what? The glory. In order to get to the glory, you got to keep running. Somebody ought to practice in place. Come on. Come on. I hear the Lord say, get your swag back. Stop running like that. Pick yourself up. Even if you feel like falling out, don't let the devil see it. Put a smile on your face while you run. Put some pep in your step. Run with patience. Because you're going somewhere. Oh, I just heard the Lord tell me to tell somebody we're going somewhere. Wait a minute, wait a minute. He said, tell the church we're going somewhere. I got to, I, I, I got to dance with y'all on this one. I said, we're going somewhere. This is why before I say this, I need three people that's going to go in with me. I need one, okay. Come on, come on out in the aisle because you're going to help me. My baby going to help me. We're going to go all the way in, Elder. We're going all the way in. See, it takes faith to shout before you find out what you're shouting about. Reason why I'm shouting is because we're going somewhere. It is what the Bible says, we have a lively hope. Now we've been shouting about cars and houses and promotions. That's cool. But we can ready to shout about we're going somewhere. That before it gets too bad, God says he's going to snatch us. Y'all oh. something about God he doesn't like to see his children suffer too long and whether he snatches you physically out of your situation or when that great day comes when he snatches us all up out of here we can shout because we're going somewhere going to a place where the wicked is going to cease from trouble going to a place where every day is going to be Sunday going to a place where I get to see Jesus for myself I don't have to go on a report of what somebody else said or what somebody else wrote. I can see them for myself. Anybody ready to go see them 
for yourself that, that you're not ready to die yet necessarily but if you were if you were to go you were ready to go tell somebody I, I don't I don't want to leave yet because he's still working my purpose out but if he were to call my name tell somebody I'm ready now now wait if you couldn't say that you need to lift your hand right now if you can't say you're ready come on everybody put your hand down if you can't say that you are ready to go put your hand up real quick okay we can shout now <laughs> if you're ready to go I want you to put in a oh come on don't play with it come on give them a celebration dance give them a happy dance somebody ought to praise him somebody ought to dance somebody ought to shout forerunner the forerunner 
the one who runs ahead. He entered into the holy sanctuary. And what I love about what he did was when he entered, he sat down. <laughs> Woo. He sat down. Now by faith, the scripture tells us that when he sat down, we sit down because we're seated with him in heavenly places. But one day, it won't be a spiritual sit down. <laughs> it's going to be a physical sit down. Because I remember him telling his disciples when they were at the table, eating bread and drinking wine. He said, I'm no longer going to do this with you again until we sit down together. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. <laughs> Woo, Bishop. I, I, I'm shouting and I'm rejoicing not because everything in my life is going grand and I'm shouting because I've been invited to sit down with him at a table that he paid for me to sit down at with his own precious blood and when I sit down I'm not going to sit down with any aches or pains. I'm going to sit down with a glorified body. This is what we have to teach our kids. That there's something better than this. See what's happened to the church is we've glorified this present world. But no, no, he said, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. He said, all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. Don't fall in love with this. I don't know what that is, but I feel that right there. Running. That's what I'm doing. When I, when I come to prayer meeting, I'm running. When I pray at my house, I'm running. When I set aside time to get in the word of God, I'm running. Can I get somebody to run with me? I'm going to let you go, but can you do this by faith? When, when this week comes, Somebody gets on your nerves. I want you to do this. Don't, don't look at them. Look up. They're going to think you're crazy, but I'm looking up because I'm running. Somebody said, well, it's not good for you to look up while you're running. But my Bible tells me that he's able to keep me from falling. So I don't have to look out for myself because he's looking out for me. All I have to do is keep on running. Run, 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 run. Somebody help me, say run. Run, run, come on, run, tell your children, run, tell your mama, run, mama if you're watching, keep running, daddy if you're watching, keep running, bishop run, 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 mama, 
run. Whatever you do, don't stop. Don't stop. Come on. something what you gonna do 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 with that sickness what you gonna do with that pain what you gonna do you're hurting but what you gonna do you're in pain what you gonna do you know what to do keep on running Keep on running, look to Jesus and run, look to God and run. Don't quit, don't quit, don't quit. Run, 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 run. One last time. 
Lord. Oh, hallelujah. 